Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I've been talking on this podcast about energy healing from different angles and different modalities for a long time and many times. Reiki, quantum healing, energy medicine, spiritual healing, Donna Eden's method, EFT, past life regression therapy, shamanism. After all, energy healing is a key phenomenon sitting right at the intersection of science and spirituality which is my work and podcast platform. It is the knowledge passed on by generations from time immemorial, now in the modern era being researched, studied and confirmed by quantum physics. So what else is new under the sun, you ask? <laughs> well, let's talk about the reconnective healing known as the reconnection. While you might be skeptical about the effectiveness and the very nature of the reconnective healing, which is understandable, after all it is so simple to the point of being simplistic, I can tell you, based on what I have learned so far, that it breaks through all the boundaries of quantum living I have been familiar with and intrigues with great curiosity my widely open and receptive mind. To say that we are going out on a limb here is an understatement. There is nothing to hang on to anymore. Perhaps just the premise that to find out what's possible and what's really going on, we must look into the realm of impossibility as we know it, nowhere else. Today's episode is a double treat as I have two wonderful guests for the price of one. <laughs> My special guests are Dr. Eric Pearl and his partner Gillian Fleer, the founders of The Reconnection. Dr. Eric Pearl ran a chiropractic practice in LA for 12 years before discovering reconnective healing. One day in 1993, his patients began reporting significant health improvements from what appeared to be some energy emanating from his hands without touching. Intrigued, he decided to research and study this phenomenon and consciously use it in his practice. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now recognized and supported by science, the reconnective healing has helped millions of people all over the world in more than 100 countries. Dr. Pearl has been featured on top media platforms including The Dr. Oz Show, The New York Times and CNN. His internationally best-selling book, The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself, is now published in over 40 languages and endorsed by notables such as Deepak Chopra. He is also the co-author of Solomon Speaks on Reconnecting Your Life. Gillian Fleer is the Head of Insight and Development. In collaboration with Dr. Pearl, Gillian oversees the direction and vision for the Reconnection and Reconnective Healings Global Community. She leads the Reconnection's internal team 
and is co-instructor with Eric for online and worldwide live programs, global partnerships, training programs, content development, program execution, and business strategy. Eric and Julian have co-authored and just released a new book, The Direct Path to Healing, a Trinity of Energy, Light and Information, which we will, of course, talk about. And now they join me from Chicago. Hello, Dr. Eric and Julian. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Hi, Anna. We're so excited and honored to join you. Yes, it's beautiful that we're um, able to have this conversation finally. Looking forward to it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's a great timing for this interview as it coincides uh, with the release of your new book, The Direct Path to Healing, which I understand happened on November 1, so just a few days ago, which we will, of course, talk about. To take us there, I'd like to set the scene for this conversation to give our listeners who may not be familiar with your work a bit of background and context. So to begin with, could you please share with us your respective stories? How did you find yourself on this energy healing path? Um, well, for me, in very brief, because a lot of people are familiar with the early story, um, I had practiced chiropractic for 12 years, and um, I had an unusual night, <laughs> which was the lamp next to my bed turned itself on, my bedroom door opened itself up and felt like someone was in my house, and I went looking, I couldn't find anyone, so I went into my office the next day, and patients started um, physically responding and feeling my hands before I touched them. Their bodies went into involuntary movements, and they started reporting healings. I mean, real healings, not everyone, but a lot of them. They were seeing again, hearing again, some of them no longer needing their canes or wheelchairs, kids with cerebral palsy or epilepsy were suddenly able to walk and run and play and speak normally. Again, not everyone, but a significant number of people. And we started looking at it from a perspective of separation, of duality, of as if there's healings that are coming in from somewhere else, from other than where we were, and how is this working? And I didn't really understand it. And, and, and my patients were having gorgeous experiences and reporting them to me. I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing the colors they were seeing or hearing the voices or smelling the beautiful fragrances they were. But we knew that something was going on and people started, um, researchers started coming out to study it and saying that they were seeing aspects of light and information beyond the energy that they were used to. Um, noticing and then people began to ask me to teach this and i said i don't know how to teach it i'm waving my hands in the air you know looking like an idiot <laughs> to do it but um mm. we found that when i agreed to teach a small adult night class of about 25 people i let them feel it i showed them how it worked they all started having successful responses to it and i was under the illusion that i was somehow through me in imparting this ability really the big illusion i was under was that i was the teacher um because ultimately if we're going to allow ourselves to um, step into our own empower we have to allow others to be empowered and the first step to that is to stop viewing them as students and ourselves as teachers so um as we followed this through i began to quote unquote teach to use the t word um, reconnective healing from the perspective that I had that healings were about um, physical changes only or emotional changes or regaining the use or ability to do things or to function certain ways. And um, over time, my understanding of this, our understanding of this, mine anyway, started to evolve as I began to recognize more of non-duality as Jillian began to open my eyes to this and share that. And we began looking at wonderful, wonderful people who give insight into this work, such as Rupert Spira and Muji and Francis Lucille and, and um, Eckhart Tolle and, and more people. 
And so it's gotten to the point where of the hundreds of thousands, 100,000 plus people who've learned reconnective healing the way I had been teaching it, people were saying, has reconnective healing changed? And um, the answer is no, truth doesn't change. But what does, thank goodness, change, grow, evolve in a sense is our ability to the human being's ability to recognize something, to explain it, to share it with light and interest. And so as our understanding of things grow and change, truth doesn't, but our understanding does. And I think that's very important nowadays. It's beautiful. Thank you. And we will dive much deeper into some of those concepts that you have mentioned. Jillian, would you like to share your story with us? Yeah, I I would say that my story is um, not a story of dynamism um, in the sense that the mysteries of the universe and the contemplations of what is the nature of uh, existence and, and spirituality and how do things happen was not something that I uh, ever grappled with. I I, I entered <laughs> into this body mind uh, with a certain, um, I'm going to say qualia, mm -hmm. qualia in that um, I was always um, able to experience things not experienced yet in a way. So uh, God, love, infinite intelligence, source, whatever name you want to give it, um, in a way, was a starting place for me. And having to understand the world was much more of a dichotomy, M much more of a dichotomy. Mm. And so it was quite, quite, quite the reverse. I always, my mother would say, I had to unzip you and, and turn you right side out so that you could sort of sense and understand the finite and at the right moment we will unzip and rezip you the way you came in <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love that so, um, it very interesting yeah eric and i's collision we always say there's a bit of a cosmic collision mm. um was not particularly um one that i would call a phenomenology or and yet, when something as vast as our true nature being revealed as energy, light, and information sort of infuses into our experience, into the body-mind, it, it was a absolute yes. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a yes, yes, yes to what was already a series of yeses in my life. So about 10 years ago, uh, we began collaborating together. And that collaboration has been so natural and so beautiful and so filled with uh, joy and love and, I always say, humility in a way uh, and a humbleness for all the lives that are touched by this approach. So, yeah, that's beautiful. Sort of how I would explain. Beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing. So let's jump right from the top. What is reconnective healing and why is it the direct path to healing, as you call it? Because there's no path. Because we are already the healing that we are looking for. We're really already everything that we're looking for. Everything that we're looking for, whether we think that it's a new house or a new car, or the perfect love relationship or, or better finances or career, Really, everything that we're looking for is merely happiness. And the happiness is the truth of who we already are on the inside. However, it's obscured to us by our experiences. We get caught up in the experience, whether it's um, road rage or uh, an, an upset that the, the new dishwasher didn't arrive on time and we had to wash everything by hand. Or, you know, whether we're just, you know, feeling a little off about something. And all of our experiences are finite experiences, like clouds or finite clouds in the sky. And when 
a lot of clouds come to the sky, the sky looks gray, but it's not. If we let them pass, the sky is blue as it's always been. And we might feel upset or anxious or this, that, or the other. And we say, that's who I am, but it's not who we are. It's the experiences obscuring the peace, love, joy, happiness essence that we are. And so therefore, what we are looking for is what we already know ourselves to be, the happiness. But we tend to go on journeys looking for it to show up certain ways through certain methods, through certain objects, through certain experiences and approaches. And that's where we get a little bit confused. So that's how we develop these different circuitous pathways. So you you said, what is reconnective healing? And and I'm going to suggest that um, the reconnective healing experience was given a name as a consolation. In the early 2000s, the experience of energy, light, and information, which we would say is synonymous, just as synonymous, synonymous as saying consciousness, not consciousness, the thing, but consciousness, one entity, if we are even going to give it such a such a description, one understanding, if we are even going to know ourselves as oneness. So it in a way, we were interacting as awareness with the finite, the 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 the, the body mind's experience. And as Eric sort of suggested, to free ourselves from the illusion of separation, where the little I, Jillian, <laughs> the personality, the characterization, the body, mind, the biology, the projection, the however you want to to kind of qualify the finite, that operating system, that sort of I sometimes refer to it as that perceiving and conceiving of who and what we are, gets so granular. It becomes so localized that we we forget. We forget our reality, our true nature. And so reconnective healing, given the name, was needed because an approach in the conversation 30 years ago, opposed to today, where consciousness is a is a, a conversation. We are we are uh, aware that we are more than just the body mind. Fortunately, we've come to that. But then we really needed to begin in a way where people were having their experience. And at that time, they were having an individualized, highly localized, somewhat defined even by really the 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 influences of Albert Einstein, a materialist understanding of who and what we are separate and distinct you know we create them we'll say in a way matter <laughs> is simply all there is right subjects and objects so that's the name reconnective healing came and i think at that time it was to inspire a curiosity about what would reconnecting mean reconnecting to what to who to the heavens, to the earth, to the guides, to the angels, to the to 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 spirit, to 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 the earth. So we we we've spent three decades slowly dissolving the attachment to that um, way in which we qualify our experience. And um, I would say, energy, light, and information. The the freeing ourselves from the illusion of that separation is all that reconnective healing is. It is, and we can't tell you the how, because as you so beautifully explained at the beginning of the show, there are many aspects to this conversation that require us to begin at the conclusion and never leave there, to, 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 to take ourselves to the absolute source or beginning or that which precedes any beginning or ending, and that would be energy, light, and information. So, we're we're we've been witnessing healing as an observer, as the witness, in a very dynamic way when we are only 
focused on the body mind, but there is something so much more stable, so much more intimate and completely impersonal to even that miracle. And it is the uh, revealing of ourself to ourself. It is the revealing and the recognition that we are healing itself, uh, expressing itself in this sort of localized projection, if you will. And so that's really the conversation around reconnective healing or the reconnective healing experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, throughout time, you know, there are expressions such as, you know, the nameless one and uh, a lot of understanding where when we name things, we actually place it into a box of limitation. And yet, still names come up because it's difficult in this human illusion of duality to have a discussion without having a little verbal handle, a little word to put something on. So uh, without having given it this much thought, I, I knew from the very beginning that there was no name for this. And the only thing that drove us to allow it to take on a name was the fact that so many people were giving it multiple names that it became difficult to have a conversation about something and know what was being referenced and the names being given to it were just inappropriate because they all had something to do with my name, Pearl Healing, Eric Pearl Natural Healing, da 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 da, da. And so um, there was a lot of information that was coming through with reconnective healing that really was not of the limitation of the intentional human cerebral mind, but the consistency of the information coming through kept bringing through the words reconnecting and reconnection. And really, I thought of this as, well, what are we reconnecting? I guess we're reconnecting to our original wholeness, our original fullness, which is not necessarily inaccurate. It's just not really comprehensive. Because what really is that, first of all, is that we never disconnected in the first place. There's only the not recognizing that we are one. You can't really reconnect or connect in the first place because if we're all one, well, to connect, you have to have more than one. So that kind of messes with that one a little bit. But um, really what is reconnecting, if we want to give into that word, is healing itself. Because as more and more awareness in the healing world, people are discovering that really if we allow ourselves to be in the concept of healing techniques, we recognize that eventually techniques must self-dissolve. That's their ultimate design. It's only the human ego that wants to hold on to the technique and complicate <laughs> the technique and bring the next layers of techniques. But when we release ego, technique dissolves. And when these little techniques that hold on different parts fragments, fractions of energy, the 612 different Reikis and the 75,000 Jinshins and Jirais and all these things, as those compartmentalizations let go, we find that it's healing itself that comes back together, which is why when we recognize that we are already the healing, then we are already infinite in who we are, and therefore we need not study 27 million techniques. We actually are that healing already. The techniques itself become the boxes that obscure or limit us from that recognition and the gift of the technique as it dissolves is that we recognize the fullness, the infinite that we are. Beautiful. I have to say, I'm loving your explanation your, and your description. And I'm loving that it goes so much deeper beyond the surface of just energy healing as a concept. I'm really loving it. And I'm loving it because it is important to give this sort of explanation, to look so deeply into what we are talking about here. So that was beautiful. Now, we know the frequencies of the brain waves, especially in the theta state of four to eight hertz, which is aligned with other frequencies such as the Schumann resonance, the DNA replication, 
hypnosis and trance, we know the frequencies of the sun and the earth. Some people claim that they know the frequencies of love, peace, and other high emotions, or the frequencies of the chakras, quoting 963 hertz, 741 hertz, 528 hertz, etc. Do you know what is the frequency of the reconnective healing? No. And none of those other frequencies that are given are known. Their opinions, their options, there may be support for some of it. But the truth is all these hurts just hurt. Ultimately, ultimately to say that love has this frequency is saying that love doesn't have that frequency. To say that this kind of, you know, that healing is this frequency is to say that it doesn't have the other frequencies. All of these assignments numerically are limitations. And the only thing that's truly representative of the limitation is the part of the mind that wants to block it into that. These are experiences, and they may be. There are these frequencies in, in love, and those frequencies in love, and the other frequencies in love, but none of them are comprehensive of love because love, like healing, is infinite. So we can have finite experiences of the infinite, glimpses into it where these numbers show up and those numbers show up and these megahertz show up. Our experiences, every experience has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every experience is finite. The experience of being human beings is finite, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And yet who we are is not limited to an experience. We are finite, and so are these other aspects. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add to that, Anna, that, um, and, and what Eric has just shared kind of uh, inspires in me mm -hmm. um, a part of this conversation that maybe encourages us to understand what you proposed as, again, that that is revealed in the body-mind experience right? So when we're talking about a particular frequency that is heart frequency or um, a particular state of brain coherence, we, we are really in what um, we would call a measurement because all this that we are referring to really is about a measurement. And so if we're measuring it, then in a way, we are localizing it. We are localizing it to our experience, even if it has uh, a infinite um, explanation to it. It's it's being observed and it's being witnessed from a localized perspective. So the frequencies, again, a name, a constellation, are in a way uh, the way we describe energy, light, and information. And and really, it was used as a, a accommodation, a form of parlance to be able to um, express one revealing of the infinite in the sense that everything would be included. So when you say, what is the frequency of energy, light, and information, really, we would say it has no frequency because it is all frequency. And and that's why even in our scientific research, we have never assigned a level or a measurement to energy, light, and information because it could not be found. The researchers okay. were able to find that it exists, but measurement's a funny word. We would say, well, could you measure them? Does it exist? Could you measure them? Yes, they can find measurements of it, but they can't measure it because they can't find the beginning. They can't find the end, and without that, you can never be sure where the middle is anyway. But what they did find was that all the frequencies of healing that were known showed up in this, although you couldn't find the edges, the parameters, the limitations to it. And that was really curious in terms of um, how we would approach a, a deep scientific study um, both at the quantum level or at the biological level. And that's always been a very interesting challenge for the reconnective healing experience. It's popular because obviously science became and has become almost like a religion <laughs> in a way. We have to be very thoughtful about um, where science comes into things because it's it feels so primary 
Um, and at the same time, uh, in this particular approach, in the reconnective healing approach, it's it's not a tremendous focus for us. The way I like to say it is science can find that it is. It just can't find what it is. Yes. And it makes perfect sense the way you have just explained it, that we can take measurements as glimpses, but it, it does not cover the totality of what is and the experience absolutely makes sense. So thank you for that. Now, speaking of the underlying concepts uh, in your work in reconnective healing, I find it curious that you split the concept of energy into energy, light, and information, which in most people's minds, it's just one of the same. In other words, energy equals light equals information or is all that. And similarly, in your book, you say that the quantum field is consciousness and awareness. So again, I'm curious about your treatment of these two concepts separately. Could you please speak to that? Well, the word split is what I'd like to look at for a moment. Um, I mean, I can give you the source of where this came from, and, and it's all in the first book. And But what I want you to understand is we didn't split energy into energy, light, and information. That comes from the the human perspective or belief that everything is energy, because that's what we've always been taught. In actuality, from as best as we can tell, the energy has existed. So um, sort of like imagine this huge bubble of energy in the universe um, that everything exists within. And as time is moving faster, time is in all directions at once, which is time is actually disappearing. What happens is the bubble just continues to expand. And so what's been in the bubble has been energy. But as the bubble expands, it becomes more sheer, more permeable. So what's been outside of the energy bubble, we could sort of use the concept of beyond the energy bubble. Aspects of light and information are now permeating. So it's not a dividing of energy into energy, light, and information. It's light and information that's allowing for the expansion of that bubble, which at one point was simply what we would consider energy. And, I, and I'm probably not doing this the highest service because we're using words to explain something and, and words are a form, you know, words help us describe color and texture and sound and smell. And what we're talking about something that is formless. So we're trying to use the duality of form words to explain something, to even explain a sort of portray a bit of a visual and yet the visual can't really be portrayed that way because the cerebral thinking mind doesn't fully grasp it so i'm coming close closer in ways of sharing what this is of addressing the question specifically with the word split but believe me by no means is that a comprehensively accurate description And by the way, I actually love your metaphor of time and the universe described in your book, which explains the or illustrates the expanding and thinning balloon as a universe which contains energy. And it elegantly explains why the information from other dimensions we are receiving now was not available to us you know, a long time ago. So in my mind, at least, it very elegantly explains the, this concept. I'm still having a bit of question mark between consciousness and awareness. Yes. Consciousness and awareness, we would use as one and the same. It's just when we are speaking about consciousness in a conversation with a materialist, it is still perceived as a thing, something that uh, the brain or the uh, field 
inspires. It's it it's so consciousness, the thing um is different from what we would call awareness or the observer or the witness. But um consciousness as we understand it and express it in the reconnective healing experience and awareness are absolutely uh unanimous. They're one in the same. They 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 are interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, we use the words interchangeably. Okay. I mean, okay, thank you. I, I can't say it any better than Jillian did. Thank you, thank you. You mentioned scientific research and tests, if you like, of the reconnective healing with some measurements, uh, which you described in your book. Could you please tell us about Dr. Tiller's research into reconnective healing uh, you described in your book, which I find absolutely fascinating. I understand that he brought in two high caliber researchers in the field of subtle energy, Dr. Gary Schwartz and Dr. Konstantin Korotkov, and the results were mind boggling. That's, by the way, what I referred to in the introduction when I mentioned going further than out on a limb. The room, the energy of the room, knowing before your workshop that this is what will be happening. This is this is expanding your mind and your horizons of thinking beyond what one might expect. Could you please talk a little bit to those tests? Uh, again, it is perception. It's how we understood things, even how Dr. Chiller understood things. We did the first study and Dr. Chiller's key person came out. He didn't come out for the first study. And the results that they got, they didn't want to share with us because they thought that the unit had somehow had a problem or broken down, even though it couldn't. And they thought that maybe we were over some kind of a um, a high energetic producing field must be under the building we were in. So they looked for it and they couldn't find it. So they came out to subsequent locations and ended up getting the same results, the same results, the same results, different parts of the world. Now. Um, they started taking measurements in the room the day before, a few days before, a couple weeks before, and they were finding it. But remember, before has to do with the illusion of time. So when does it start? Well, is there a beginning point or a when. I mean, even for me, when when the healings had first begun and, and people were coming from around the world to my office, they didn't know anything. There was no book. There was nothing. They were told that they were brought into um, one of the rooms, they'd take off your shoes, lie down, relax, and I would walk in and their bodies were already in involuntary motions. And I used to say, gee, the room started before I got there. I mean, that's the way it looked. And the concept of before, in reality, there is in the infinite also the infinite knowingness that that which is is and it isn't based upon when the second hand or the minute hand of a clock strikes 12 it just is that so what dr tiller found was that something started changing with people quite dramatically. But did it begin when they first decided to attend a training program, even before they arrived? Did it begin before everyone hit the room? Now, I'll tell you what the measurements were, but remember, measurements are what science chooses to look at, what science has or creates equipment to measure. It's the the measurements are actually the capacity of, and at the same time, the limitation of the scientific equipment of that time and B, the scientific mind and how it chooses to take the data and interpret it, which we know is personal. But here's what happened. The measurements, the objective measurements of the room, Dr. Tiller found raised the level of what he called, um, what's the word? That's it. <laughs> there was um th- there was a thermodynamic measurement in there. And as soon as I think of that full three-word phrase, that would help me. If you have it, but it raised the level of the room to the equivalent of 300 degrees Celsius. 
300 degrees Celsius would obviously kill a human being. It was the equivalent to 572 degrees in Fahrenheit. So what it was called was, he spoke about the reciprocal space. It was called excess thermodynamic free energy. Now, ultimately, what does that mean? Excess means more than the norm. Thermodynamic relates to, it's it's temperature related Free, you could think of as floating around freely. There's actually a better way to explain that, which which we've done um, in in the new book in in the direct path. But ultimately, in the measurement of the way the energy was flowing in there, couldn't possibly have happened according to all understanding of scientific mind less than 300 degrees Celsius or 572 degrees Fahrenheit, which would have killed people. Now, ultimately, the measurement of temperature in that room fluctuated just a little bit, but it did fluctuate in coordination with that. Now, that's interesting to the cerebral mind, but what does that really mean? Except we're seeing something, able to calculate something, able to quantify something that shows us that something actually is when what's really of ultimate importance is that it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a scientific standpoint, thermodynamic free energy is really our awareness of uh, uncoupled energy. And in some ways, it takes us back to the bubble. The localization of what we perceive and conceive as energy in height, width, depth, and time is limited to height, width, depth, and time. So as the reconnective healing experience unfolds in awareness, our, the recognition of awareness, there is, um, an, in a way, a dissolving of this uh, localization of height with depth and time. So we're when when we think of the bubble as expanding, it's getting thinner and more permeable. What's been on the outside of it starts interacting with what's on the inside. And at some point, it gets so sheer and permeable that there is no outside or inside. And that is what somehow with his equipment, which Honestly, um, William Tiller was such a tremendous researcher, and he's passed away now a few years ago, but the the equipment that he was playing with was really, in a way, to explore just this, the free-floating, as he would refer to it, or thermodynamic free energy in a reciprocal space. And the reciprocal space would be that that is not limited to height, width, depth, or time. We might refer to it as this idea of other dimensions, I think you you refer to it. Again, uh, these other dimensions are just, again, illusionary enclosures. They, they become illusionary enclosures that begin to soften a little bit as we are in the recognition of our tr- sort of true nature. Mm-hmm. As as that soften, I, Rupert Spira uses a great example. It's like if you had a very firm circle where the pencil line was um, was 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 quite dense and thick. As we begin to dissolve the illusion of height, width, depth, and time, that circle, that very dense circle, starts to soften. Maybe it becomes perforated. And there are, you know, uh, perforations in it. And then the perforations start to actually dissolve. And really, what are we exploring? We are exploring what has always been there. We're exploring what is ever present without any change. That is consciousness. That is really the discovery. Um, it's not something more in a way. It, it is a return to or a remembering of what we are prior to, we'll call the experience of height with depth or time. I might even say that's the experience of our human embodiment. That's the experience of uh, 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 of the body, mind in flesh and bone, you know? So mm-hmm. that delineation or differentiation starts to become less formulated 
inform. And interestingly enough, you know, the sages have been studying this for eons. <laughs> this 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 innate I, this innate knowing I, I am, which requires no recognition or validation from the mind. The brain does not validate the knowing I. And that's a very interesting inquiry. Um, one that we, yeah, it's fascinating. We explore it a lot. It's, it's actually on a, what we know more than anything else we know. Absolutely. So, so Dr. Chiller being very established, I mean, you know, he's, he had published hundreds and hundreds of papers and, and multiple books. What he was recognizing in this, he also was talking about a lot before uh, a lot more mainstream researchers started recognizing this was a, a coupling, which was that seeming interconnection where what one was receiving, everyone was receiving in the room, in the space, and ultimately around the globe and throughout the universe. And, you know, for some researchers at that time, this, you know, Professor Emeritus from Stanford University, his languaging was really causing them to stretch their thinking comprehensions inside. But over the years, you saw more and more of them start to get it on different levels and receive it and accept it. And I think in this moment on a quantum entanglement, um, in, in, in the way that Again, William Taylor was deeply vested in, uh, I would say, prim his primary form of research was uh, entanglement in, in the way that um, the synchron synchronization between two molecules is separated by time and space through an exchange of instantaneous information. So this was a beautiful uh, opportunity to explore the vastness of this approach. And um, and I think it was very helpful for its time. It was also followed up a little bit by Glenn Ryan, who chose to look at some of the studies around the reconnective healing experience and how DNA would unwind and rewind in, 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 a, in a magnificent uh, healing sort of capacity. He set up his, his studies in a way by intentionally damaging DNA in the laboratory and watching it recoil, rewind to a healthy state again. It would cause it to almost die, to unwind, and found that left alone, it could start to recoil. They, he started working before he knew about reconnective healing with energy healing techniques and found that they would slow down that healing, that recoiling, and he, in his mind, he started thinking, well, if energy healing slows it down, it must be slowing it down to let it take its time to really heal thoroughly. So he came and approached us and he said, well, reconnective healing has such, you know, powerful, dramatic results that it would slow it down even more. And I said, I, I don't really think so, but you're welcome to test it. And in his examination, he found that not only did it not slow it down, it actually expedited the healing, but not only that, but reconnective healing, as aside from the, the healing techniques that he was studying, was the only one that didn't only heal the intentional damage that he imposed on the DNA. It actually healed the pre-existing damage in some of the DNA samples. And this, and he did this repeatedly with human DNA as well as animal and plant DNA. So let's just take for one moment and 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 rest in this premise, something that is essential to the very nature of our being must precede all finite experience, right? Anything that has a beginning or an ending, if you will, can't be essential to us. And really, that is where the reconnective healing experience is most valuable. It's most valuable at at the at the point in which the inquiry of what precedes our experience is and becomes um, curious to us, it allows you the glimpse of that infinite of what precedes the experience. And each time we glimpse that, it sets about a series of ongoing glimpses. <laughs> Thank you.
Absolutely. And I'm loving this conversation because what I'm hearing is that that boundary of that balloon that is thinning is in fact an illusion. And when we can understand this and and expand our awareness to no limits to the infinite, the balloon doesn't exist. Correct. Effectively. And ultimately, n- neither will the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Well, the analogies and metaphors are helpful for us to understand, to get onto the right trajectory of our thinking, because obviously, as you have mentioned earlier, our logical mind, as wonderful as it is, has serious limitations, in particular in terms of understanding of of higher level concepts that we have no language for and no and no concepts for. So, so uh, it is uh, helpful and in fact often necessary. A, an attendant question that I have on this point is when we still stay with the with the image of the an understanding of the balloon containing energy and us and the time expanding and all the information that is outside of that balloon of our universe with the boundaries thinning. What came to my mind uh, as you were speaking to it is that that what we call psychic phenomena, which is information many people receive through other than our physical senses, comes through those holes, through those pores, through those thinning veils. In fact, thinning veil is a fairly common term now being used in the sort of spiritual circles, that the veil is thinning. I think conceptually, we're talking about the same thing, the boundary, the veil is thinning. So would you agree that those psychic phenomena, as we call them, is effectively information getting through that thinning veil to us? I think that when we attempt to look at phenomena or phenomenology we're 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 moving away from the simplicity of uh the nature of consciousness and and we have to be just a little thoughtful in our language um when we are willing to recognize that it is not what we see as the world, but how we see the world as our reality. There is a quantum shift in this whole idea of uh, the phenomenal. We are extraordinary, and I know we've played with that. We we perceive and conceive the extraordinary expressing the very very extraordinary and, and and in some ways we want to temper the ego long enough invite it fully in as a participant in um uh in in the reality of our true nature long enough for it to come to rest and then this idea of um, receiving something phenomenal uh, doesn't really feel quite authentic. What starts to glimpse to us is we are those messages. We are one universal entity expressing itself as 11 billion things. One consciousness localized as 11 billion experiences. And, and there is a way for us to test the truth of this. If, if consciousness was becoming 11 billion different consciousnesses, what would the world look like? Of, of course, consciousness isn't becoming 11 billion consciousnesses. So we we have to start to do an introspection alongside our reasoning. And and the body mind is there for the tool, the expression, the experience of reasoning. 
But as we glimpse and as we become more curious about what is it that is aware that I am aware, okay, then that idea of something out there communicating with us is worth a little deeper exploration. And what ultimately we hope to arrive at is there's nothing out there. The Mm -hmm. world is in here. But the word phenomena keeps it appearing other than or out there. We we had a friend who, um, let's just say he was a few years older than us. He went to the World's Fair in time to see a little one-inch square box with people dancing inside. Crowds were looking into this box. It was the first little television. It just had a little square. People were, how did they get? That was phenomena. Yes. And now we turn on a television, we walk in the house, we want background noise, and now we don't turn it on at all because sometimes it's just annoying. So the point is phenomena is a perspective on that which is. And as soon as we grasp that, then we start to recognize we have so many people come back and say, oh, after my reconnective healing experience, I become a psychic or I've become, you know, clairaudient. I'm receiving messages. Something's happened to me. No, you've become, you've allowed yourself to recognize. You've revealed you to you. This is all of us. We all receive, but we, in, in, in not allowing ourselves to have seen that all the time, we think we become something else. It's like saying, you know, when will I become enlightened? And the answer is when you stop asking when, because the concept of when is not allowing you to recognize that it is now and you cannot become that which you already are and you are. Absolutely. And it does make perfect sense as perhaps complex as it may seem, I'm speaking about your explanation, it actually does make perfect sense. So in essence, it depends on to what extent we will allow our consciousness to expand as opposed to being limited. It depends on our will, where we place our consciousness, to what extent we we will expand it, what experiences will come to our life. Beautiful. I'm just going to offer up for consideration. What if it is that consciousness, our consciousness will not expand? What will happen is we will allow ourselves to see it. It will, consciousness, it's not even ours, it just is. Consciousness will reveal itself to us. We will reveal ourselves to ourselves. So it will appear as if consciousness has expanded when it's actually our ability to recognize it that is we've allowed. And then and sometimes we refer to that as a dissolving of otherness. Right. In our new book, A Direct Path to Healing, this conversation that we're having is, is really where our focus is. Uh, we speak about it sort of at the beginning in the first chapter as the gift of the healer. But in the small seven chapters of this book, it ends with, I am the healer. And, and this dissolving of a sense of separation really is the answer in every way to our infinite awareness, or as Eric or Rupert Spira always refers to, happiness, that which we seek, we already are. Mm -hmm. And, And so this is starting to become an intriguing inquiry. And that is, to me, what is so exciting. I'm very enthusiastic that even this conversation we're having um, is is one that hopefully people will will not just enjoy, but it might challenge them mm. to look at what is my purpose. And, and I just want to touch on that, Anna. I know you haven't really um, asked that question, but it's a question for me, especially with all the variety of different people that you interview on your podcast, which I love, by the way, and you have such a beautiful diversity of, of guests. But we are, I think, at that one sort of final gateway or doorway. And some of it has to do with our addiction to states of mind. And 
this idea that it is through the states of mind that ultimately we arrive at awareness or enlightenment. And in actuality, it's, it, it is the releasing of all states um, that allows us to explore uh, our being. And yet, when we are seeking our purpose, what is our purpose? What is it that we are here to do? Do what are we here to give? What are we here to 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 uh, transform, uh, evolve? There is such a strong focus around the individual and that sense of individuality. What is it that you're going to discover? What is the 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 the, the premise or the book or the um, patent or the degree that you're going to get that makes you you? And somehow we have to begin to really question the validity of that as life progress. Mm. That is not where life progress lives. And, and I think a lot of our definition of healing is that inquiry that your purpose is one purpose. It is the recognition that you share your being with everything and everyone. That is our purpose. And in that is revealed the happiness that we are. Absolutely. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you. Now, I would like to talk briefly about the healer and the healing. And I have a specific question to ask here. Uh, While we all have the potential to do energy healing, as I understand, and I believe some people are born natural healers, uh, also called natural healers, while others may find it difficult or even impossible to develop the skill to the level of mastery just like with singing, dancing, playing an instrument, or learning a foreign language. In other words, everything that requires a talent beyond the skills that can be learned. In your book, you said everyone is special and no one is special in terms of having the power and capacity to be a healer, as I understand. But then you said being a healer is a gift. Could you please explain and reconcile these concepts for us? And do you accept that you are a natural healer, Eric, at the level that may not be accessible to many others? No. To the last question, I'm going to start with no. Um, I'm going to say that it's not what allows us to become more or less of a healer, or it's really that we are we are brought in with a certain kind of a veil, you could say, an obscuration to the recognition of who we are, and it's how rapidly we release that veil. There is no one healer on this planet who is more special than another. There is no one healer on this planet that is more special then another from the very beginning of sharing this work we know that when you experience re- a reconnective healing training program you have the capacity to leave with the ability to facilitate any level of healing that jillian can that i can that any special famous recognizable name in, in brazil or the himalayas can because we are all that infinite and someone cannot be more infinite than another or there's not infinite. You can't add to the infinite. You can't have two infinites because infinite is simply that. So all there is is the obscuring, the obscuration of the recognition of who we are. That's the healing. Born a natural healer? Yes. And so is everyone. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you. And if anything you'd like to add to this, Jillian? So I would only add to what Eric said from the perspective of the observer over this last decade of how people perceive Eric, and not just Eric, but um, I've had the really the the honor of um, 
sharing with many renowned published healers, if you will, or notable healers. And, and I think that the same, um, worthiness issue is how I'm really going to frame it, uh, is what is permeated around this very question that you're asking. So what isn't a gift? Breath is the gift. It is the gift of that, that we are all that is the divine source. Again, whatever you wish to call it. Thank you for bringing it back to that. I totally over passed over that aspect. It's so important to hear what Jillian's saying. But again, when we are perceiving and conceiving from this local perspective, where there is a subject and an object, there is a you and there is a me, that uh, is the, uh, I'm going to say the hotbed of where our uh, worthiness issues are incubating. (laughs) And they are interesting, um, especially if they've been coupled with trauma, or they've been coupled with addiction or mental illness um it it really does become uh, uh this sort of source of separation and in a way when we look at the great religious teachings if we, we if we really look at the history of how healing has happened i mean you even take parables you know supposedly stated by jesus these things I do, you shall do and more. You know, it, even at that level, we have lost this understanding of who and what we are. So, yes, when someone perceives or conceives that they are out of control, lost in fear, lack, limitation, illness, poverty, that they need something external, what they're really saying is, I have walked so far from the truth of my reality as one. I need the remembering or the recognition of my shared being with everything and everyone. And that is the reconnective healing experience. What what happens in the gift of healing in a reconnective healing experience is that the practitioner, the facilitator is adept has, we'll say, mastered the capacity to dissolve otherness, to to receive in a way where there is no separation between that and another. And that is where the healing happens. And and I think that's the clarity that we, um, I think I'm so thrilled we may be at the precipice in this particular moment in time and space, this new epoch where we're really intrigued to explore that, to investigate that very truth. You're worthy. I just want to say, you're worthy by having been born. You're not worthy if. You're not worthy if you believe in this messenger from God or that messenger from God. There was not one person so many thousands of years ago who's more worthy than you. It just was representing the infinite of the worthiness that everyone is so that we can see that in ourselves, not on a pedestal of distinction. So is the gift of the healer our recognition that we are a healer? Effectively. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, listen, we walk through, um, five in between chapters. We explore the gift of energy, light, and information, the gift of receiving. Um, chapter four is my favorite title that I had to really fight for. And it's called the gift of mindful mindlessness. And that is an, an, an extraordinary challenge for, um, for us, uh, to, to really explore that and then the gift of co- the coherent catalyst and the gift of distance i hope you don't mean you had to fight with that chapter title with me i was i'm very happy with it <laughs> maybe she does mean that i don't know but i don't remember just um, in general you know i think the key is uh, the way you explain it so beautifully anna the key is the knowingness of who we are it's never about walking into the healing room and moving your hands clockwise or counterclockwise. It's not about the 
objects that you purchased or you're wearing or that you bring in. It's not about the techniques or what comes first, second, or third. It's not about the protection. It's about the recognition, the revealing of yourself to yourself, the knowingness of who you are. And that presence allows for the facilitation of the healing because it is the recognition that you are the healing, not the healer or the healed, because that separates us into subject and object. You are healing itself. You are not the witness or the witnessed. You are witnessing itself. And that's key for us to understand, to release the subject-object separation, even in our languaging, because that perpetuates it in our perception. Thank you. Now, I guess my next question would be on many people's minds. You offer online specialist courses and in-person certificate courses or certification courses. If, as you say, there are no techniques or processes involved in, in the reconnective healing, and it is so easy to do and straightforward, what do your courses teach and what people get the certification for? It's a great question. So in 2016, we created an online experience called The Portal, and we gave it the name a level one course, but it is really an odyssey. And the way that it was constructed was to deconstruct, to truly unravel the path, if you will. So we constructed a 10 hour or really eight hours plus some other fun material, but eight hours. And we broke it into five to seven minute segments in every hour. And within every hour, something from all eight hours was included. And the reason that we did this was to begin to prepare someone who might want to come to an in-person experience to begin their self-inquiry, to, to begin the journey of everything that we've been talking about so that when they arrived at the in-person gathering, which is our Catalyst program, which we can talk about, they already had a sense of this this being this this their questions were already answered on almost every fundamental level as a materialist i'm going to suggest so that the duality could soften and the non-duality could almost be glimpsed but not quite the training program or what we call the reconnective healing catalyst program for many many years was a seminar. And that's how it was named. It was a seminar. It was an opportunity to come together as a group and really explore the um, unimaginable. We took the idea of imagination and we dissolved it. It wasn't something you could find in your imagination. It wasn't something you could experience in your imagination. It wasn't even a play that a form of play that you could conceive in your imagination. And that became extremely important and fundamental to what makes the healer the healer, which is their capacity to recognize that it wasn't them, the little I, the person, the body mind, orchestrating the healing. So yeah. I, I'd like to use a little bit of an analogy that addresses the way you phrased your question. If you accidentally drop a glass and it shatters and you slip and fall on it and it cuts your face, you might not want a big scar on your face. So you'll go to a plastic surgeon who will probably take some dissolving stitches, knit the skin back together while it heals, and then the stitches should dissolve. And if they don't dissolve, when you visit the doctor for your checkup, the doctor will remove those stitches. Some of the ways in which we are sharing with you how to recognize this, because it's all about recognition. It's really not anything different. It seems so strikingly different because we haven't recognized it, are what I refer to as dissolving stitches. You might learn, hmm, if you open your hands a certain way, you allow a different recognition of sensation, for example. If you allow your body a certain kind of fluidity of motion, you discover other aspects of awareness or recognition. What happens is we show you that to discover it, and then we say, now, 
you need to let that go. And you need to let that dissolve. And if you don't let that dissolve, we're going to talk to you to show you how to actually (laughs) remove those stitches so that you can stop trying to do the healing and allow yourself to be who you are, being that healing, because we are either doing or being. So yes, we might show you things that look a little bit like here's a little technique, but you must let it dissolve. You must let it dissolve because reconnective healing is I could use the word technique free. It's without, you can't technique your way into healing any more than you can technique your way into love. It's a state of being, people might create books with little pointers, try this, try that, develop your relationship, meet your, your soul partner, find a way to explore energy in the healing world. But ultimately, all technique is there to self dissolve and simply leave behind the fragrance of its essence and as julian said you become the healing correct but you don't actually become it you already are it you recognize that you are the healing yes so your training programs are designed to help people get to that point And, and recognition is a beautiful word because really until there is recognition i Another way it's expressed often is, as Rupert Spira would say, is the truth of our experience. But this recognition is all that matters, Anna. Yeah. It is the zero point of all truth. And that is why often we will say, forget everything we've ever said to you, everything, and allow your investigation, your inquiry around the truth of your experience or your recognition to be revealed, to be revealed. And I do think that um, this approach often uh, is a is a, a huge catalyst for that. Mm. And um, it may be an important intersection of our human experience together where that uh, will be very useful. Yeah. Really, our own healing is our own recognition. It's the recognition of of what some people might call our our true self, even though true carries a little bit of judgment here and there that we don't need to use. And, and, And healing like love is also, it's the recognition of our shared being, which is that essence of truth. So all the things we're looking to heal, if those things don't need healing, it's allowing ourselves to recognize who we are ourselves. Absolutely. Coming back to the zero point. Thank you. Now let's talk about your books. We have already talked about several topics and concepts you wrote about, especially in your latest book. So just more broadly, how different is your latest book, which you have co-authored from the previous books uh, that Eric uh, wrote earlier on? And what is so special about it? Just briefly. Um, As we touched on earlier, um, the first book, The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself, I love it. And it's got so much in it that is timeless. It's, It's And yet it also explains from a very easy to understand concept and yet our understanding yet a duality, the way things appear, as we talked about earlier. Certain things appeared in some ways as if they were separate and distinct, and yet we're recognizing that they're not. So, look, the first book was, um, I didn't know how to write a book. Hay House reached out to me and said, write a book. I said, how do you write a book? They said, do it like this. They said, put it into three sections, but the, the, the first portion of it should be about your history and what you've gone through in your life and growing up. And, and the second thing should be, um, 
about the discovery of reconnective healing and what it is. And the third portion should be a basic how-to. So I followed the little formula, you know, just add water and poof, <laughs> there was a book. Now, I was very happy with that. Uh, it was a struggle. It wasn't easy for me to write because I'm not an organized person who knows how to put my thoughts together and write everything, but I did. And there's lots of story around that we won't go into. Now, at the same time of these healings, people were coming in to receive healings even before there was a book. And about three or four months into it, one patient and then the next and then the next started losing consciousness. And over the first three months or so from when this began, over 50 different patients lost consciousness and started having messages come through them. And I listened and I thought, all right, you know, I'm bound to attract these types of people. But um, they were powerful. And we held on to that for about 20 years. And we finally published that in a book called Solomon Speaks on Reconnecting Your Life about 20 some years later. And, and the beautiful, curious part about Solomon Speaks on Reconnecting Your Life is in the last two years, we've started to read this book together as part of our Reconnective Life community, um, sort of a book club. And it's fascinating to, at, at the very core now of reading this book, the recognition has uh, just exploded for our community. The, the, the recognition of everything in that book could be read from a perspective of duality. There is a channeler and these are channeled messages and they were for Eric, but they're also for us. The reading of this book now is this community reading it as one voice, one universal shared being that in the perceiving and conceiving of just the activity of reading the book, they couldn't quite dissolve. And yet this year we could read three lines and it's, it is if it's one cacophony. There's no channeling. It's the absolute, we'll say formula form in or formless in form through these words. And they are all resonating. Um, as information that they're sharing. It's it's just incredible how concept, that's happened. Yeah, the concept yeah. of channeling is is in a way it's a positioning. I channel, I'm special. The information is channeled in, so it must be special and 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 positioned. And it's really as we dissolve that, we start to recognize the infinite beauty and insight that comes through this without any need to position anything over anything else. So those were the first two books. Do you want to talk about the direct path? Well, we've been talking about and the direct path first, of healing. Right. Yeah. You know, the direct path to healing really began as a uh, a manuscript um, in 2017. And we were in Rigi. I was waiting for that. We were <laughs> yes, in Rigi. Yes, we were in Italy. We were, Italy um, Switzerland. Yeah. Wherever Rigi is. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's in one of those two places. It's it's, it's on the border. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was uh it was so clear for us that this new book was going to be a bit of a challenge because um the simplicity of the message was sort of being overshadowed by the um, fascination with discovery, science, and the ultimate, we'll say, um, query of, um, you know, how's, what's, and why's. How, what, and why was was really spirituality and science coming full circle and attempting to collide again. But it, it still had quite a bit of, of space between it. And so we had to just so um, lovingly rest and then movement and movement and rest. But the, really the book was written in its entirety almost then. But the movement and rest of how to formulate that in words is really what took these last years to be in a way courageous and brave enough, I'm going to suggest, to, to, to be that simple 
to stand in the truth of what reconnective healing and the reconnective healing experience has always been about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to really know that this conversation was not about any one person's story. It wasn't about one person's discovery or one person's special moment near death experience life after death experience it wasn't about that at all it was our curiosity curiosity of what precedes all of that formulation yes thank you i have read the book i absolutely love it and i will include obviously all the links in the show notes to all your books so that people can purchase them and I and I highly recommend them. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now, could you tell us more about your courses and other offerings, how people can contact you and work with you? I think the best way to explore our offerings is to go to our website, mm -hmm. thereconnection.com and reconnectiveacademy.com. Reconnective Academy is really where the in-person live training um, schedules and courses around the world are uh, offered. And there are links from the reconnection.com to get to Reconnective Academy. And I hate to but, point out the obvious, but I'm going to because sometimes it gets confusing. The reconnection.com begins with the word the and Reconnective Academy does not have the word the in front of it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll make sure I will include the link. Yeah, I think that's the simplest way. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of the nice um, parts about this sort of moment in our offerings is really somebody who is exploring this experience needs to sort of decide where they want to begin. And I would suggest that you could begin anywhere in our offerings. There isn't one specific place. Now, there's a prerequisite to attend a live event because we want you to come in uh, ready in a way to kind of uh, embrace that experience. But overall, I would suggest that peruse these offerings and see what uh, ignites a little enthusiasm in you. You know, enthusiasm is a really truthful way to look at instinct not so much intention. And so just play and and yeah, that would that would be beautiful. Thank you. Well, we have covered quite a lot of ground here and I do hope that our listeners now have a much better understanding of the reconnective healing and as I've said, I will include all the links in the show notes. Well, Eric and Gillian, thank you so much, but before we close would you like to add anything to what we've talked about, perhaps a final message or a key message, something that you would like to leave our audience with? I would only suggest that we consider the opportunity to say yes to everything, to allow the innate intelligence of our true nature to direct and guide in this exciting experience we are all sharing. And uh, in that, we develop a very new relationship to all and every experience. There's nothing that takes us out, if you will, because we are tasting the truth of who and what we are. And um, so I would encourage us to, to, to sift and, and play there a little bit. Beautifully said. Well, Eric and Gillian, thank you so very much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on my show. And I can't wait for your next book or your next offering or whatever else might come on your journey. Uh, and uh, I, I do encourage our listeners to reach out and contact you browse through your website, find the entry point or the next point on their journey, because I absolutely agree with your earlier comments that we are now at the very important, at the very significant, if not critical 
point in history, point in time, which doesn't exist. And we didn't even talk about that, <laughs> that yet. But it is a really significant point of our experience collectively and individually. So that's why I was so thrilled when you accepted my invitation to to appear on my show and talk about those issues. So thank you so very much. So, thank you, Anna. So grateful to be with you, Anna. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.